flames. The bar was not open for business on Monday. To make matters worse, n neither the business nor the building was insured and the total cost for replacement of the items lost in the fire would now be left for the owner to bear. There are no reports of injury and the Ghana Fire Service was able to contain the fire before it could spread to the upper flat of the building or any other surrounding buildings. The cause of the fire is still unknown at this time. Investigations are ongoing. Four persons who were recently fingered in the robbery shooting death of gold miner Dion Stahl made appearances in the Georgetown Magistrates Court where they were made to answer to the charges of murder of the gold miner uh, separately. Another four persons were also charged with accessory to the very murder. All eight persons were remanded to prison by the magistrate after they were not allowed to enter a plea to the charges which were laid indictable. The four who were charged for murder were Shane Morgan, bar owner Ro Roberto Sankar, Dwayne St. Hill and Steve Rolox. The other four who were charged with accessory to the murder were Odetta St. Hill, Duncan Vanderveel, taxi driver Keith McKenzie and Dr. Lanza de Santos, who allegedly treated the injured bandit at a private home in Safari, contrary to established laws. Odetta St. Hill is the sister of Duane St. Hill, who is facing the murder charge. The attorneys representing those charged with accessory to murder argued for their clients to be released on bail, but this request was denied by the magistrate. The prosecutor informed the court that on October 14 at the Silver Street Kitty, Georgetown businessman and gold miner Stahl was shot dead during a robbery attack after arriving outside the Eldorado Trading Company. The two bandits who attacked the gold miner were forced to retreat empty-handed after the miner opened fire on them even after being shot to the body. He later collapsed and died. Following the brazen robbery attack, ranks of the Ghana police force swung into action by issuing wanted bulletins and detaining a number of suspects including relatives of the shooters and the doctor who was suspended of treating the bandits who was suspected rather of treating the bandits following their escape. The two matters will continue on November 15, 2019. Police investigators have since revealed that they are still on the hunt for at least one other suspect. A meeting between the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union, GAU, the National Association of Agricultural, Commercial and Industrial Employees, NASI, and the Ghana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuku, ended prematurely after officials from both unions pinned placards to their chest which caused officials of the corporation to abandon the meeting. More in this report. Both trade unions say the demand by the corporation to put away slogans was an inconsiderate and an unreasonable request. The meeting had representatives from both unions, along with Guy Sukut's chief executive, Dr. Harold Javis Jr., and finance and marketing director, Paul Bim, among others. The union's delegation included 30 workers and union officials who had attached to their clothing small placards, highlighting the need for the corporation to grant a wage or salary increase to sugar workers. But this didn't sit well with the Gaisuko officials, as they objected to it, contending that the placards were not allowed on the premises. And since the union reps insisted in keeping them on, the meeting was abandoned. Gao says it is disheartening for them to recognize that a state-owned company is seeking to apparently muzzle the expression of its workers. Open quote, Guy Suko nevertheless decided to disregard our sincere and valid contentions and went on to abandon the meeting. Our unions, as concerned stakeholders, were eager to engage the corporation on its plan and cancellation of the meeting by the state-owned company was an unfortunate development, end of quote, according to the union. Both teams had agreed on meeting over the fact that sugar workers' pays has remained unchanged since 2014, and the aim was to review it. Gao contends that official statistics has confirmed that the cost of food, for instance, has risen by 17%, with several staple food items going up in excess of 20%. At the same time, workers have confronted several other increases through the imposition of taxes and hiking of tariff fees. Also, several long-standing conditions of work, 
enjoyed by sugar workers have simply been ignored by the current management of Gaisuko, the union posited. Despite the challenges, Gao and Nasi have committed to continue to advance its demands in the coming times regarding a pay rise to workers in the sugar industry. For Globespan 24-7 News, this is Kingsley Bryan. The Ghana Elections Commission has revealed that the ongoing claims and objections exercise has been a total the Ghana Elections Commission has revealed that the ongoing claims and objections exercise has seen a total of 3,924 new persons already registering since the exercise began at the beginning of this month. GCOM's Public Relations Officer Yolanda Ward informed media operatives that the Commission has completed 17,243 transactions so far, of which 9,516 are transfers. The Commission also informed that there were 1,672 corrections, 1,627 replacements, 472 photo retakes and 32 objections recorded during the exercise as well. The claims and objections period officially began on October 1 and will run for 42 days, allowing persons who are above 18 years who are not on the National Register of Registrants to register. The process also caters for persons who wish to update or make changes to their addresses and other details so that they can be eligible to vote at the upcoming March 2020 elections. As of October 24, the Commission began to display data from the House to House registration process for claims and objections. The PRO noted that the list is published in two parts, Category A and B, with Category A being those persons under the age of 18 years. As such, only those on the Category B list can make claims now. The recently concluded House House registration saw over 370,000 persons being registered. Meanwhile, on the preliminary list of electors, there are 646 thousand six hundred and twenty five names the ongoing claims and objections period comes to an end on november 11 2019 remember to like our facebook page and subscribe to our youtube channel for the latest news in ghana the caribbean and around the world more news still ahead you're watching globespan 20 travelspan gt is a proud sponsor of globespan 24 7 news here are some exciting news from travelspan gt Fares have dropped for next year, starting January 20 to August. American Airlines has cheap fares on non-stop flights to New York. Flights are as low as $306 US dollars one way and $540 round trip, all tax included. Take advantage of these cheap fares on American Airlines non-stop flights to New York. Travelspan has also cheap fares to Miami, Toronto, Canada and the Caribbean. Call Travelspan GT in Georgetown at 227-1701 that's 227-1701 or in Rose Hall call 337-4298 and New Amsterdam at 333-6230. That, that call Travelspan GT in Georgetown at 227-1701. That's 227-1701 or in Rose Hall call 337-4287 and in New Amsterdam at 333-6230. News. Thanks for staying with us. We continue tonight's news by telling you that several communities along the coastal region of Ghana, stretching from the west coast to the east coast, continues to be battered by the ongoing spring tide. In the meantime, the Civil Defence Commission CDC, through its 24 hours national emergency system, NEMS, is monitoring the situation as it, and is in contact with all the regional administrations that have activated their regional disaster management system and are conducting assessments and updating the commission. The CDC is coordinating with key agencies and ministries, including the National Drainage and Irrigation Authority, NDIA, and the Ministry of Public Infrastructure. Additional teams will be deployed to affected regions to augment their response mechanism and continue the response that commenced on Sa commenced uh, a few days ago in Region 3 and in Region 5. Let's take a look at the situation in Cornelia, Cornelia Ida, on the west coast of Demerara, where one resident posted an online video.
The above normal high tides are expected to continue tomorrow. And in other news, three individuals, Shane Morgan, called a demon, male Negro, 38 years, a laborer of Lot 45, East, East Lepenitens. Duncan Vanville, called a black boy, male uh, Negro, uh, age 39, a laborer of Lot 741, Chesterville, Savaya. And Yoganan Basio, male East Indian, age 30 years, a taxi driver of Lot 66, North Savaya, East Street, Georgetown were all arrested on October 15 and charged today with robbery on the arms, contrary to Section 222C of the Criminal Law Offences Act, committed on Yong Kwan B, which occurred on September 13, 30, sorry, at Rob Street, Georgetown. They appeared at the Georgetown Magistrates Court, number one, before Chief Magistrate Anne McLennan, who read the charges to them. The AJA was applied and they all pleaded not guilty and were remanded to prison until November 29, for report and statements. The Ministry of Public Telecommunications, MOPT, heartily congratulates a team of eight youthful budding Guyanese technology engineers for fighting against many odds and coming out of the 2019 Global Robotics Tournament holding, a strong, holding strongly to their 39th place in a field of 190 competitors. The first Global Robotics Competition was held over three days in Dubai and according to STEM Guyana, the local ICT experts responsible for selection, mentoring and training, this young team overcame strong logistical odds, showed remarkable resilience and ended the world tournament in the top 25% in the world rankings. The MOPT has been partnering with STEM Guyana since 2016 when Guyana's evolution towards a digitized nation gained serious momentum. STEM Guyana has since attracted partners in other governmental agencies as well as non-governmental organizations. Since then, and in keeping with the national objective to ensure that Guyana's children have access to every available facility to become tech savvy, Minister Catherine Hughes has been presenting robotic kits with workbooks, stationery and other material to STEM Ghana, the two robotic clubs in the primary and secondary schools, community groups and libraries. Team Ghana comprised youths of Hague, West Coast, Demerara, Tamiri, Enmore and communities in Georgetown. STEM Ghana's partnership with the Ministry of Public Telecommunication also allowed a team of robotic tutors to utilize community ICT hubs with which the ministry has equipped with Wi-Fi connections and computers for training. The Commission of Inquiry COI into the 2018 deadly piracy attacks on Guyanese nationals off the Atlantic coast of the Republic of Suriname has been extended by President David Granger. The COI has been conducted by Dr. Rishi Sheer Takur. The public hearing was scheduled to be completed by September 2, 2019, and the Commissioner was expected to gather the evidence to ascertain the persons to be charged in relation to the attacks. However, according to the Head of State, there has been insufficient evidence presented to the Commission, and as such, he has ordered an extension to the inquiry. President Granger's comment came during an interview with news sources on Sunday last. Uh, the inquiry has now been extended to December 31, 2019. Last year, pirates attacked 20 Guyanese fishermen who were in four fishing vessels in Suriname's water. Some were chopped and some ordered to transfer their cash. Their catch. Sorry. One man reportedly witnessed his captain being bound up and dumped overboard. Another said he saw his colleague's arm being chopped off. Five men survived by jumping overboard and swimming away. Days later, another fishing boat was attacked with the captain, a Guyanese, killed and crewmen dumped overboard. Some 12 fishermen, all Guyanese, are still missing after the deadly attack that took place between the Suriname and French Guyana borders. A suspect in the deadly attack was remanded to prison on May 12, 2018 for allegedly robbing two fishing vessels, one in 2015 and the other in 2016. President David Granger was speaking at the 175th anniversary General Assembly of Queen's College on Tuesday said that Ghana must transcend all revolutions to realize its truest potential as a global leader in education. More in this Kingsley Bryan report. The head of state delivered the future address at the General Assembly of Queen's College in commemoration of the nation's top school 175th anniversary. At this juncture, the president said 
Ghana's development is hinging on the country's ability to forge ahead despite its challenges, especially in the area of education. Ghana must not allow itself to be handicapped. We must move ahead or we will be left behind. Science and technology education is essential to mastering the skills needed for establishing knowledge-based industries and for modernization. There is good reason to continue to emphasize this form of education. It is essential to acquire the skills necessary for social, economic, and industrial transformation, and which will play a more transformative role in making the internationally competitive. According to President Granger, a developed STEM program also allows for a more technologically advanced and well-positioned Guyanese workforce. He said, while many advancements have been made, Ghana should still be in building mode to effect true transformation. Ghana still needs and will continue to need new skills to populate the occupations in the green environment, in the petroleum sector, and in the digital economic sector. Ghana will need an A to Z of scientists, from agronomists and architects and biologists botanists, chemists, doctors, engineers, all the way down to physicists and zoologists. We need them all. We need you all if we are going to transform this country. To this end, President Granger reiterated his plan to have a decade of development, which will allow for much emphasis to be placed on the education sector. He also noted that free education is not a governmental invention, but a constitutional injection, which for too long has been ignored and must be restored during this decade. He however maintained that this emphasis will not reduce investment from the other sectors. This emphasis, however, will not diminish attention in the humanities, particularly in the social sciences. The country will continue to be the conference. Authorities, bankers, economists, historians, why not, and managers. President Granger further added that with the advent of STEM disciplines, GAN is now well poised to take advantage of the technological breakthroughs catered to our national development. For Glotspan 24-7 News, this is Kingsley Bryan. Youth was remanded to the juvenile holding center earlier today after he was charged with the murder of a Guyana Defense Force soldier, Elijah Chesney. The police said that the teenager appeared before Magistrate Delon Bess at the Georgetown Magistrates Court and was not required to plead to the indictable charge, which alleged that he murdered Chesney, 18. The incident is said to have occurred during the course of a robbery on October 14, 2019. Chesney, who lived at Deville Safari, Greater Georgetown, was found clad in a white t-shirt, black pants and blue hoodie, along with a white hat. His body bore two suspected gunshot wounds. Bess will return to court on November 18. The owner of Poplar Guinness Bar located at Durban Street, uh, Georgetown, that was destroyed by fire on Monday evening, estimate his losses to be in the vicinity of over $10 million. Troy Mendonca said that he was alerted about the fire from the owner of the property who called informing him that the building was in flames. The bar was not open for business on Monday. To make matters worse, n neither the business nor the building was insured and the total cost for replacement of the items lost in the fire would now be left for the owner to bear. There are no reports of injury and the Ghana Fire Service was able to contain the fire before it could spread to the upper flat of the building or any other surrounding buildings. The cause of the fire is still unknown at this time. Investigations are ongoing. The Guinness Bar located at Durban Street, uh, Georgetown, that was destroyed by fire on Monday evening, estimate his losses to be in the vicinity of over $10 million. Troy Mendonca said that he was alerted about the fire from the owner of the property who called informing him that the building was in flames. The bar was not open for business on Monday. To make matters worse, n neither the business nor the building was insured and the total cost for replacement of the items lost in the fire would now be left for the owner to bear. 
There are no reports of injury and the Ghana Fire Service was able to contain the fire before it could spread to the upper flat of the building or any other surrounding buildings. The cause of the fire is still unknown at this time. Investigations are ongoing. Travelspan is a proud sponsor of Globespan 24-7 News. Travelspan has some cheap fares to Guyana on American Airlines flight. Fly from January for 234 one-way and 512 round trip. Take advantage of these cheap fares on American non-stop flights from JFK to Guyana. That's non-stop flights from JFK to Guyana starting as low as 234 one-way and 512 round trip. And also has the cheapest fares for Christmas that starts as low as 799 round trip. Travel Span celebrating 25 years in business with over 10 offices to serve you. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Or book online at Travelspan.com. Book early and save. The Skeldon Hospital has received yet another upgrade with a recent recommissioning of a refurbished maternity ward. The maternity ward was renovated at the cost of $3 million through a successful public-private partnership between the Public Health Ministry and the Florida Guyana Hope Incorporated and their local counterparts, Guyana Florida Hope Incorporated. Head of the donor agency, Mohammed Yassin, said the project, while initiated in January, actually got on the way in March of this year. The goal, he noted, was to provide a more comfortable space and privacy for the expectant mothers who use the facility. The new maternity ward is equipped with five beds, five recliners, fully air-conditioned, five bed bedsides, cabinets, and a private bathroom. The Skeleton Hospital has seen a rise in the number of patients and is expecting to see a forward increase given the upgraded maternity ward. According to the doctor in charge, Dr. Ryan Campbell, the Skeleton Hospital treats an average of 40,000 patients annually between the villages of Eversham on the quarantine to as far as the remote indigenous communities of Oriala and Siparuta in the quarantine river. He also highlighted that from 2016 to present, the hospital has admitted over 450 maternal patients with over 320 successful deliveries and 149 transfers. And since 2017, the hospital has recorded zero maternal and zero stillbirths, he noted that the partnership with the donors and the hospital not only seeks to provide upgraded infrastructure and service delivery but also a relaxed environment for the maternity patients. Join us after these messages for more news with To keep up with breaking news in Guyana, the rest of the Caribbean and on the international scene, like, follow and subscribe to Globespan 24-7's Facebook and YouTube news page. Join the conversation, get live news on the go and news and details right here on Globespan 24-7 News. And now for the news in detail. Five years after Nicole Jagan mysteriously disappeared while on her way to hairdressing class, her younger brother, Andron Jagan, has also gone missing from a supermarket in South Trinidad. Police did not report whether the two cases are connected but an investigation has been launched. Police said Andron's disappearance was reported to them by his mother, Vicky Bagwandas Jagan. The woman reportedly told police her son left for the supermarket but did not return. Meanwhile, reporters said that the teen's father, who was separated from Bagwandas Jagan, said he did not believe his son was missing. He said the police never visited his home to interview him and he was unsure whether or not his son was actually missing. Nicole went missing on February 10, 2014. Police said they suspected a Venezuelan link in her disappearance because the family received midnight calls from a number in Venezuela for a month after the mysterious disappearance. And Chilean President Sebastian Piñera has said that he will be making changes to his cabinet as part of an effort to suppress mass protests which have taken over the country. He announced that eight ministers, including Interior and Finance, will be replaced. The move comes two days after Mr. Piñera put the entire cabinet on notice. Despite the announcement, protesters have again clashed with security forces today in the center of the capital, Santiago. Reports are that dozens of firefighters are also tackling a huge fire in a shopping center near the presidential palace in Santiago as well. 
Some 20 people have been reportedly killed since protests over inequality erupted more than a week ago in the South American country. And today, new details are emerging. The impeachment probe concerning U.S. President Donald Trump said that an Army veteran who heard a call between Mr. Trump and Ukraine's president admitted that he was concerned by the demands made to scrutinize a rival. The decorated Army veteran Alexander Vindman told Congress he twice reported his objections to pressuring Ukraine to investigate Democrat Joe Biden. And according to reports, Colonel Weinman is the first White House official who heard the call to testify as a part of the impeachment inquiry. The inquiry concerns alleged abuse of power by the president. Colonel Vindman was among select officials who were authorized to listen in on Mr. Trump's 25th of July call with newly elected Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, which sparked a whistleblower complaint and led to the impeachment probe. President Trump has been accused of pressuring Ukraine into investigating unsubstantiated corruption claims against Biden and his son, who worked with Ukrainian gas company Burisma while his father was the U.S. vice president. But the president has denied wrongdoing and called the impeachment inquiry nothing but a witch hunt. Separately, the gender reveal party didn't pan out as organizers had planned. Instead, an explosion at the bash killed a 56-year-old Iowa woman. Marion County Sheriff Jason Sandholt said the woman Pamela Crimier was hit in the head by a piece of flying shrapnel, which killed her instantly on Saturday. According to investigators, then, Crimeyer family was experimenting with different types of explosive material on Friday leading up to the gender reveal event. The plan was for a big bang, but instead of creating a spectacular blue, they inadvertently built a pipe bomb. The explosion remains under investigation. And turn our attention now to the UK. Following a vote in the UK Parliament shutting down Boris Johnson's call for early elections, a new vote today has cleared its first Commons hurdle as MPs backed the PM's decision without a fuss. But the Parliament will continue to debate and vote later on amendments, including a Labour proposal to change the date to December 9. The Prime Minister can only hold an election with the support of MPs, who have blocked it three times. Meanwhile, efforts by opposition MPs to lower the voting age to 16 and allow EU nationals to take part have failed. A report said that proposed changes to the PM's early election bill to extend voting rights were not selected for a debate by the Deputy Speaker, despite enjoying cross-party support. And Saad Hariri, Lebanon's Prime Minister, has announced his resignation owing to protests that have engrossed the country for almost two weeks. Prime Minister Hariri said Lebanon had reached a deadlock and needed a shock to break the crisis, to which end he made this decision and his announcement was met with cheers from protesters. The mass protests began against now scrapped plans to tax WhatsApp calls but quickly widened to target political corruption and economic turmoil. Lebanon has one of the highest debt levels in the world. The protests have led to a 10-day closure of banks, with many other offices, schools and universities also remaining shut. And we tell you now that some 37 people have died and hundreds feared trapped on the ground after a landslide hit a city on Monday in the west of Cameroon, according to officials. Reports are that rescuers have been looking for survivors in the remains of houses flattened by earth, dislodged after heavy rainfall. Meanwhile, regional governor Fonka Awa Augustine said people had built homes on unsafe ground despite governmental warnings. Heavy rains have continued beyond the regular rainy season and authorities fear that the death toll could rise as the rescue operation continues well into the night. Also, seven persons are reportedly dead and many others injured after the country experienced a deadly earthquake in the southern Philippines. The victims, including a seven-year-old boy and his 44-year-old father, died after they were struck by a boulder. 
Authorities have warned that the debt toll could rise further in the days ahead. The 6.6 .6 magnitude quake hit Mindanao Island on Tuesday and has resulted in major damages across the Philippines. And finally, to end the news, a man in Australia has been jailed for raping and murdering an Arab-Israeli student in a high-profile case. It is alleged that Cody Herman, 21 years old, attacked Aya Maswari near university in Melbourne in January. Her death sparked a wave of anger about violence towards women in Australia, prompting vigils which were attended by thousands of people. A judge jailed Herman for a maximum of 36 years calling it a savage attack. The student had been living in Melbourne on a one-year university exchange when she was murdered. In her sentencing remarks on Tuesday, Judge Elizabeth Hollinsworth described Miss Maswari as a kind young woman who had her whole life in front of her. And that has brought us to an end to the day's regional and international news. We'll now give you Kumar Doshi with today's Tech Beat. Our topic for today is smartwatches and fitness bands. A smartwatch or a smart wristwatch is a wearable computing device marketed as much as a cell phone. With a glance, it gives atomic clock accuracy and allows you to read your text messages in a device that is always at hand. A smartwatch includes a variety of features such as a watch, cell phone, calculator, camera, GPS, micro SD card, touchscreen and rechargeable battery. Apple, Samsung, Sony and other major players offer smartwatches on the consumer market. An activity tracker also known as a fitness tracker or fitness band is a device for monitoring and tracking fitness related metrics such as distance walked or run, calorie consumption, and in some cases, heartbeat. Here are some of the similarities and differences between fitness bands and smartwatches. Here are some of the things you can do with smartwatches and fitness bands. They display notifications to alert you of important events and activities. Beyond displaying notifications from your phone, a smartwatch is only as good as the apps it supports. Apps ecosystem vary and they are tied to either Apple or Google's environment. Most smartwatches paired with smartphones can manage media playback for you. They also include a heart rate monitor and a pedometer to help you track your workout. Most smartwatches also include a GPS tracker for tracking your location or receiving location specific alerts. If you are a hardcore athlete, a dedicated fitness band is likely a better choice than a smartwatch. Here are some of the sensors found on smartwatches. Accelerometers are table stakes in wearable games. They measure body movement to track your steps and sleep pattern. Gyroscopes measure rotation for a variety of purposes. They feed data into exercise tracking algorithms and can sense when you are turning wrists to look at your watch face, thus waking up your display. The heart rate monitor can measure heartbeats and also warn the user if the heart rate spikes to a dangerous level. When you want a device that helps you communicate and keeps you up to date or one that tracks how you are maintaining your health, a smartwatch is a multipurpose device. While fitness bands are specifically used for health and fitness purposes, Smartwatches are more expensive than fitness bands, but that difference in price comes with a lot of trade-offs. There is a way more functions in smartwatches than a fitness band. You can also miss out on a lot of apps that are designed for smartwatches and are not compatible with fitness bands. Fitness bands are usually less accurate than smartwatches. Since smartwatches multitask, they are more prone to battery drain than fitness trackers. As of now, there are more options in fitness bands than in smartwatches. But in the near future, we will see smartwatches being as popular as regular wristwatches. That wraps up for the Tech Beat for today. I'm Kumar Doshi bringing tech news from India 
and back to Whitney for more news to come. Thank you. Thanks. Here's a look at what's happening in sports. We'll tell you with this Sunday expected to be the annual horse race meet. More sponsors have come on board with the organizers for the Nand Passat and Company Mega One Day Sprint Classic Horse Race Meet. Apart from the main sponsors, Banks AH Limited and Trophy Stall, the other sponsors throwing their support are Punai Pharmacy, NTN Television Station, Rice Owner M. Rahim, Businessman Cyril Singh, Another Rice Farmer N. Rupnarain, and the NPG Packaging and Plastics Inc. The event is promoted by the Sky Plus Incorporated Promotion Group and will be held at the company's racing facility at No. 36 Village, Macedonia Estate, Quarantine, Babies. More than 30 horses have been registered so far for the event. Seven races are listed with price monies totaling over $4 million, trophies and other incentives. Races will be contested over 880 and 660 yards. The feature event for horses classified G3 and lower has some of the top animals lined up. The race for animals classified J and lower has the likes of Uprising King, Awesome Banner and Plain Land in contention. There is an event for L-Class Open Horses where Pikachu and The Rock have been entered to date. There will also be an event for L-Class with no winners. There will also be a special race for those horses that did not place in the two L-Class races. Champion, jockey, trainer and stable will all be rewarded with trophies and other incentives. Compliments of Mr. Ramesh Sunesh of the Trophy Star. Interested persons can contact Mohini on 600-4728 or Amanda on 618-5966. The coordinator is Mohendra Mohin Pasad. Also in sports, the Ghana Jaguars will play their first of two practice matches beginning Wednesday at GCC Ground Border. The Jaguars will then depart Ghana on Monday, November 4 to begin competing in the 2019 Regional Super 50 Tournament. This Friday, the Jaguars will play their second practice match at the Enmore Community Centre Ground. Both practice matches will begin at 9 hours 30. National select players Gudekesh Moti, and Niall Smith will appear for the rest in the first practice match, while in the said match, Kelvin Umrao will do duties with the Jaguars. The teams for the first match tomorrow are as follows. The Ghana Jaguars, Chandrapal Hemraj, Tej Narayan Chandrapal, Leon Johnson, who will be serving as a captain, Christopher Barnwell, Raymond Rifa, Anthony Bramble, Jonathan Fu, Kimal Savory, Ramal Lewis, Virasami Pomal, Clinton Pestano, Ronsford Beaton, and Kelvin Omro. And on the rest side, we have Trevon Griffith, Kevin Sinclair, Kevlon Anderson, Tevin Imlak, Vishal Singh, Ricardo Adams, Anthony Adams, Ronaldo Ali Mohammed, Richie Luknot, Keon Joseph, Gudikish Moti, Niall Smith, Raymond Perez, and Ashmi Ned. Meanwhile, Bangladesh's Test and T20 international captain Shakib Halasan has been banned by the ICC from all formats of the game for two years, with one year of that sentence suspended, after he accepted three charges of breaching the ICC anti-corruption code. The charges are as followed. In the first instance, he breached Article 244, which has the failure to disclose to the ACU full details of any approaches or invitations he received to engage in corrupt conduct in relation to the Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe. T20 International Tri-Series back in January 2018 and or the 2018 IPL. Also, failure to disclose to the ACU full details of any approaches or invitations received to engage in corrupt conduct in relation to a second approach in respect of the Tri-Series in January 2018. And finally, failure to disclose to the ACU full details of any approaches or invitations received to engage in corrupt conduct and that was in relation to the Sunrisers Hyderabad versus the Kings 11 Punjab match in IPL 2018 on October 26, 2018. Subject to him satisfying the conditions in respect of the suspended part of the sanction, Shakib will be free to resume international critic on October 29, 2020. The ICC has since relayed that Shakib 
had accepted the charges and agreed to the sanction in lieu of an anti-corruption tribunal hearing. And that has brought us to the end of today's Sporting News. We turn back to you, Samuel. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Before you go, here's a recap of our major headlines. Eight remanded for gold miners shooting. Four charged with murder. Over 3,900 new persons registered in ongoing claims and objection exercise. And meeting between Gao Nasi abandoned over pinned placards. Also, President Granger addresses 175th anniversary of Queen's College and Skeldon Hospital recommissioned with new maternity ward. Thank you for watching Globespan 24-7 News. On behalf of myself, Kingsley Bryan, the teams and technical team in Ghana, New York and India. Until next time, do have a great evening.